I'm going to get the right screen up and running here. Uh, so my purpose, can everybody see the slide? That everything's working okay? Okay, great. Uh, so my purpose for this evening is to uh, sort of build on uh, the really fine presentation that Ben Kidd did a, a while back, um, last summer, I think. Uh, he talked about PCB design and uh, and how to do uh, your own circuit boards. Uh, he stopped with through hole components, the the traditional way of doing printed circuit boards. Uh, my goal for this evening is to convince you that you can do surface mount. Uh, I know I was really nervous about surface mount, uh, really uh, leery of of getting into it. I tried to hand solder a few surface mount components and was really dissatisfied with the outcome. And uh, and so uh, early on during the pandemic, uh, what, my first big pandemic project was uh, was getting into surface mount and figuring out how to do it. And uh, so my goal for this evening is to convince you that you can do it too. So uh, if I could spell, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, so surface mount technology or SMT and uh, reflow soldering are, are well within our capabilities. Um, everybody, anybody who, uh, who builds uh, populate circuit boards and does soldering should be able to do uh, surface mount. It's, it's really not all that much more difficult. Um, I've certainly concluded that uh, doing your own printed circuit boards uh, is a, a big win over breadboards and um, and they're cheap and they're quick. Uh, it, it's really quite amazing. I, I can get the five small circuit boards manufactured and uh, delivered uh, via DHL from China in uh, about two weeks. And the whole thing is 25 or 30 bucks. Uh, it's a custom board. It, it's really tough to beat. And they come out looking just great. And uh, my third big, thing I want to convince you of is that reflow really is easy uh, and you can uh, fight it and do hand soldering with surface mount but I would say don't bother. So a little bit of technology uh, terminology first. Uh, uh, you'll see two terms SMT and SMD. Uh, SMT is surface mount technology and SMD is a surface mount device and, and we'll see some a bunch of examples of surface mount devices. Uh, uh, it struck me as I was putting this presentation together that uh, some things never change. On the left is good old uh, Manhattan style uh, uh, construction, uh, carving up a, a, a copper clad board and into islands and soldering legs of components on either side of the gap. Well, that's surface mount. That's exactly what surface mount is. Uh, you have a circuit board that instead of having holes that you poke wires through, have little pads, uh, tinned uh, copper pads. Uh, you put solder paste on them, you put the components on them, and then you use something to melt the solder and everything's soldered in place. Uh, so in, in many ways, it's not so different. Uh, you uh, the components look very different, of course, and you can see right away here that things are not what you would see on a on a through hole board. Um, the yeah, see if I can do some pointing here. See if my technology will work. Where is my? No, nope, it's not working. Okay, I'm going to do it this way. Um, So uh, this obviously is uh, an integrated circuit. You've got eight contacts. Uh, this is this is the type of uh, surface mount device that actually has still has leads on it. Uh, most of the newer stuff has no leads, uh, and I'll talk about why in a minute. Um, this is probably a resistor. Uh, this is probably a capacitor, a diode. Uh, I'm guessing this is a uh, um, voltage regulator, chances are. Another resistor probably. Uh, not sure what that is. Capacitor, maybe. 
but uh, in in all cases, what you what you see is uh, a couple of pads and a, a pool of solder on the pad that is holding everything in place. That's the entire mechanical connection is, is that pool of solder. So uh, reasons that I was interested in surface mount. So I, I like, like most people, I think, who, uh, who start building their own stuff, uh, I started off with breadboards, um, either the just basic breadboards with an array of, of pinned holes, and you uh, end up with a real uh, nightmare of wires running around on the bottom side of the board, connecting components together. Uh, I did a fair bit of what, uh, what Ben referred to as kit bashing, which uh, I'd never heard before, but I love the term. Uh, buying little boards, each of which does one function, uh, a voltage regulator, a timer, uh, uh, a display, whatever, and connecting them together, building up a finished product out of bits and pieces. Uh, I did a fair bit of that. And, um, uh, and then I decided to get into making my own printed circuit boards. The projects were too complicated uh, to do either breadboarding or uh, kit bashing. And, um, and I wasn't really happy with the way things were turning out. Uh, one of the other reasons that I wanted to get into surface mount is that through hole components are getting harder to find. Um, they, uh, the new stuff particularly, uh, it's not unusual for new components to come out only as surface mount devices, uh, no through hole equivalent. And that's particularly true uh, for the highly integrated stuff like microcontrollers. So if you want to embed a, a microcontroller in your project, uh, you can still get Arduinos that are through hole. But if you want to do a serious microcontroller, an ARM kind of microcontroller, uh, they don't come in through hole. Uh, not the, not this, the uh, faster ones anyway, maybe the very, very simplest ones you can get as through hole components, but uh, anything very serious is uh, in, is exclusively surface mount. Um, I find surface mount to be more reliable as well. Uh, you're not hand soldering, or at least not the way I do it. You're not hand soldering, and uh, so there's there's less variability in in uh, caused by soldering technique. And as you'll see, it looks really professional. I'll I'll show you an example of a board that I soldered up in my oven. And um, and it it looks like something that came off an assembly line someplace. Uh, surface mount technology has some real advantages. You can get much much higher part density. Uh, the uh, contact spacing is about twenty percent of what it is for through through hole on average. Uh, Lots of components have no leads, uh, so uh, the pa all of the typical typical passive components, uh, resistors, capacitors, inductors have no leads whatsoever. So the entire footprint is the component itself, and that saves a lot of space. Plus, the components are tiny, uh, uh, so they uh, the the equivalent resistor will take up less space in surface mount than it would as a through hole, even. Uh, ignoring the the effect of the passive components like um, uh, uh, like uh, uh, decoupling capacitors and and that kind of stuff on the bottom of the board and then flip the board over and solder the rest of the components on the top. And the ones on the bottom, even though the solder melts again in the oven, will stay where they are because the surface tension is strong enough to hold them on the board. They won't fall off. Uh, you can do what are vias and pads. A, a via is a way of getting from one side of, of the board to the other. It's a hole through the board. Uh, and uh, with surface mount, you can put vias in the pads, which save spaces. And for RF stuff, uh, 
and non RF stuff, actually, if you're just building a, a microcontroller into a project, because the, the leads are either very, very short or non-existent, the leads are what radiate the, the RF. So uh, your circuit is going to be much quieter in terms of uh, electromagnetic interference because you don't have all those little tiny antennas sticking out of all your components. The traces on the board are much shorter, uh, which also reduces EMI. Uh, so it's, it's really good for uh, RF, both designing and building RF circuits, but also building uh, other supporting equipment that's going to be used around radios where you're concerned about, uh, about the background noise level. And another really cool thing is that if you don't feel like putting it together yourself, most of the companies that manufacture custom boards uh, also sell components and you can give them a component list and they will build the board for you and send you a finished board. Uh, uh, and they'll test them for you too, if you want. And it's not actually hugely expensive. Now, I don't want you to think that, uh, that I'm anti-through-hole. There are actually some reasons to stick with through-hole for certain things. And, and you'll see if you look at the insides of, of uh, your various pieces of electronic equipment, usually what you end up with is, is a hybrid. And the things that tend to remain through-hole are the things that are uh, either big, like transformers, if you have uh, transformers. Uh, connectors. Connectors are, are a great... Um, candidate for continuing to be through hole because you get uh, a lot of strain relief with uh, wires stuck through holes and a big blob of solder holding them in place. Uh, we rework, removing components and putting components back on when things fail or don't work out the way you think they're going to work out. Uh, it can be somewhat easier on a through hole board. Of course, the tolerances are looser, so uh, you don't have to be quite as careful with placement of your components. Um, so there are some, some things that, for which through-hole is still valuable, and, and you want to stick with it. So what do you need to do to, to get into surface mount? You need to start thinking about pads instead of holes. Uh, KiCad uh, that Ben talked about uh, is, is just as good for doing surface mount as it is for doing through-hole design. It takes care of uh, of uh, all sorts of issues for you. Uh, you have to think differently about component selection. Uh, you've got a whole, whole new world of components that you're probably not familiar with. And uh, for me, the big thing was figuring out how, how I was going to do the soldering. Um, routing can be a challenge because things are so, so much closer together. The good news is uh, surface mount makes doing multi-layer boards really easy. Multi-layer boards with through-hole components are challenging because you've got all these holes going through the board, and that breaks up the layers and uh, and can cause it, it can create all sorts of little eddy currents that that in in the layers between holes that cause a lot of trouble. Uh, with surface mount, you don't have all those holes going through the boards. And so doing a multi-layer board is actually uh, pretty straightforward. And, and that helps with routing. And it also makes a big difference for EMI because you, uh, what you typically do is you, you uh, bury things that are going to radiate in between a couple of ground planes. And you get a lot of shielding out of that. Uh, it also helps with heat dissipation. Uh, because you, you, can, you can have a, a layer of copper that is uh, basically a, a sink, a heat sink, and is helping to carry away heat from these little tiny components. To give you a sense of the size, um, the, um, uh, let's see, get myself a marker here. So this, this is a, a one millimeter by one millimeter dot just for scale. I, obviously it's not on your screen, but, but think of that as a one millimeter by one millimeter dot. Uh, the, a lot of the typical stuff uh, that you see on, uh, on homemade boards is, is this size. So it's about a millimeter by two millimeters, something like that. Uh, 
I've regularly worked with things that are a little bit smaller. I've done a little bit of 0402. That's as small as I've gone so far, but there's no reason I couldn't go smaller, I think. Uh, picking them up and putting them on the board gets to be the challenge with the really tiny stuff uh, and and not, <laughs> not picking them up with a pair of tweezers and having the, the part squirt across the room where you, and you never find it again. Spares are your friend. I always buy lots of extra components because invariably I end up losing some when they, they pop out of the tweezers. Um, <clears throat> so these things are, are really, really tiny. Is the is the point here? Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the different kinds of packages. Uh, we're all used to packages with leads on them, uh, and and you can see here this is one of the one of the reasons that the new highly integrated devices like microcontrollers only come out as surface mount devices. Because if you had to put wire leads on them, uh, they would be huge. Uh, uh, it's uh, one of the projects I've designed uh, uses a, a microcontroller that has uh, 240 pins uh, in this kind of package. So right around the outside of the of the package, uh, a, a chip with 240 traditional uh, pins coming out of it for through hole would be colossal. It would be, you know, the chip would be that big. It's just insane. Uh, so uh, that's why the the new big scale stuff like microcontrollers is, is coming out exclusively um, surface mount. Uh, and the, and the, there's a real trend toward getting rid of the leaves, uh, the leads entirely. Uh, if you look at the um, uh, voltage regulator modules and, and and those sorts of things where you've got uh, high frequency switching happening, uh, you really want to get rid of the leads completely. And, and so they go to uh, an, a no lead package like this, where the contacts are just pads on the bottom of the chip and the pad on the bottom of the chip sits on the pad on the board. Uh, most of these, the, the pad, it, it's a little bit hard to tell, but if you look closely, you can see the the pad wraps around the side of the chip a little bit so you can get a test lead on it. Uh, it makes it easier to test with. The, uh, the, the real uh, devil in this space, uh, which I have not attempted to do anything with yet, is what's called the ball grid array or BGA package. And um, uh, in a BGA package, all of the contacts are on the bottom, uh, totally inaccessible. And your circuit board has little has little wells uh, that receive the little tiny ball, and uh, you put solder paste in the wells, and you set the chip on there, and the and the solder flows, and and uh, and it's on, and there's no way to get a test probe down there to test it. So, uh, it, it's it's generally considered to be challenging for the for the home brewer, uh, and I have not yet attempted it. But uh, in theory, it should be doable. So what do you have to do to get into this? Uh, you have to add a wing onto your house, uh, get a little extra power brought in, uh, buy a pick and place machine for a million bucks or so, uh, buy a, a commercial reflow oven for a million bucks or so. So after a few million dollars, you get this. You can do a blinky light in surface mount. <laughs> but seriously, you have to decide how you're going to solder. You can solder by hand. A lot of people do surface mount soldering by hand. It can be done. Uh, I can't do it because I've gotten to the point where the soldering iron moves quite considerably when I hold it. Uh, you can use hot air. Uh, uh, you can buy what's called a, re a hot air rework station. And basically it's a, a fancy heat gun uh, with uh, various kinds of nozzles you can put on it to direct the flow uh, in exactly where you want it and, uh, and to control the temperature of the air very carefully. 
And you can use these to both build boards and to uh, rework boards, to repair boards. Uh, people use um, skillets and it, and it works. Uh, it, it, it probably wouldn't work well for really high density pins where you need to control the temperature pretty carefully. Uh, but for low density stuff, uh, it, it seems to work pretty well. I decided to go the, the reflow oven route. And, uh, and like everything else, uh, there are uh, cheap Chinese reflow ovens on the market. Uh, for a few hundred dollars, you can, you can buy a commercially made reflow oven from China. And, and they work. They have issues. Uh, not surprisingly, you get what you pay for. Uh, but they do work. Uh, being stubborn and liking to do things on my own, I decided to uh, to do a, a home conversion uh, on a toaster oven. And I found a kit <clears throat> uh, called the uh, Controlio Three. And uh, this is not an ad, this is not an ad for this kit, but I gotta say I I I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, it made the whole process very predictable uh, and uh, and very easy, I will say. Uh, and truth in advertising, when it comes to mechanical stuff, I'm pretty good with electricity. When it comes to mechanical stuff, I'm kind of a klutz. And, uh, and this took a lot of the fear out of this process because I'll show you some of the pictures that the guy who uh, designed and sells this kit uh, put together for the build instructions. It's the best build instructions for anything I have ever seen, period. Uh, the build instructions were just fantastic. And you start with a $30 uh, toaster oven and you end up with uh, a very nice reflow oven that you can do modest size boards in, very capable. Uh, so I forgot to explain reflow soldering. So the idea with reflow soldering is uh, instead of putting solder, uh, instead of soldering one contact at a time, you put solder paste, which is a, a mixture of very, very fine ground up metal and flux uh, that comes as a paste. And you can buy it in, in little tubs, you can buy it in syringes. There are lots of forms you can get it in. Uh, but basically, you put this paste on all of the pads. Uh, you do that first. And, uh, and the easy way to do it is with a stencil. And the companies that make printed circuit boards uh, will also sell you for a few dollars more uh, a nice stencil that you can use to put the solder paste on your, your board. And you just squeegee it on. You, put this, you, you tape the board down so it doesn't move. You line the stencil up, tape it down. And, uh, and put some solder paste on the, on the top side of the stencil and just squeegee it onto the board. And it goes through the holes and you end up with just the right amount of solder paste on each pad. Then you come along behind and you place the components. Uh, you can use a pair of tweezers. Uh, I've got a nice little vacuum uh, pick and place tool that uh, Heiko makes. Uh, battery operated, it, uh, it looks sort of like a, um, it's about the size of an electro electric toothbrush. And it's got a little probe that comes out the front and, and a little rubber suction cup. Uh, and uh, it has a little uh, low power vacuum pump in it, just enough to pick up the, the components. You set them down in the solder paste and take your finger off the button and the component is placed. Uh, and so you place all of the components and then you take the whole assembly, uh, the, the printed circuit board with all of the components on it uh, and you run it through uh, a heat, a very precisely controlled heating and cooling cycle. Uh, you warm everything up, you hold it there for a while uh, to let every, all of the temperature stabilize. And then you fairly quickly take it up to the to a temperature where the metal in the solder paste melts. And that's called the liquidus point, uh, where it, it turns from a, a, a mixture of um, uh, flux and ground up metal into solder, what you would recognize as solder. 
uh, and you hold it there for a very fairly brief period of time, half a minute, a minute, something like that. Uh, and then you do a controlled cool so things don't crack on the on the way back down. So you don't cool it off very quickly. You, you take it down slowly. And um, uh, and this is something that's well within the capability of something like an Arduino. Uh, and uh, and the uh, software to run this oven is uh, open sourced. It's up on GitHub, uh, so you can modify it if you want to. You can define profiles. Uh, manufacturers for their so various kinds of solder paste will specify the, the uh, heating and cooling profile that you need to use for that particular solder paste so you don't have to figure it out on your own. Mike, th does the paste hold a component in place like a temporary glue? It does, yes, it does. It's sticky and, uh, and it, it does a pretty good job of keeping things from wandering around uh, these, which is a good thing because these components are so small and lightweight that if you uh, if you breathed hard on on the board they would go flying away. So so yeah, the solder paste holds things in pa in place until you run it through the oven. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and you can apply the solder paste by hand as well. The board that I'm going to show you. Uh, at the end here, uh, I actually didn't have a stencil for. I just, I just used a syringe and and put little blobs of solder paste on all of the pads by hand. <clears throat> so a uh, very nice kit, very complete, very well thought out. Uh, he even he even put a band aid in for people like me who uh, can't do a project without leaving a little blood on it. And I did use the band aid. Uh, you start off by stripping the the uh, your toaster oven. You take the things out of it that make it a toaster oven, by and large, except for the heating elements. You're going to use the heating elements that were there, uh, but you take the electronics out. You take the mechanical. I actually removed all of the mechanical knobs from mine to make a little extra room to work inside of it. Uh, you do a lot of sealing. Um, in order to follow uh, the, those reflow profiles precisely, uh, the oven needs to be much more tightly sealed and much better insulated than your typical toaster oven for making your morning toaster pastry. Uh, and so you use this red RTV, uh, which is uh, quite heat tolerant and seal up every crack. The idea is to have it uh, totally totally sealed, no holes where the heat can get out. And then you'll see here in a second, we're gonna come back and uh, do quite a bit of insulation. Uh, you uh, install these three uh, solid state relays for switching the, the AC that drives the, the uh, heaters, heating elements, uh, so they can be switched under computer control. You put in a lot of insulation. Uh, the, the It's a combination of, um, uh, metal clad, uh, um, spun glass, uh, you know, fiber, glass fiber insulation, which is the silvery stuff with the dimpled uh, surface, that's the metal cladding. And then the, uh, the gold stuff, it, it just is, is a very ref efficient reflector of, uh, of infrared uh, to hold the heat into the, in the oven. You also, uh, the kit comes with an additional heating element uh, to, so you can take the temperature up pretty quickly in the oven. You can throw a lot of watts at it. Uh, uh, I installed a separate uh, 15 amp circuit just for the reflow oven because uh, when, it's, when it's heating at full capacity, it, it draws 12 or 13 amps. Uh, one of the last steps is uh, is to put in this really interesting uh, spun uh, glass bat insulation. I'd never seen this stuff before. Um, it is it's like fiberglass insulation, except even more insidious. You end up with little tiny pieces everywhere. Uh, so you really want to wear a mask and gloves and and uh, some clothes that you can throw right right in the washing machine after you get done, because it does get everywhere but it does a great job of insulating without a whole lot of thickness. Uh, 
and uh, and you end up with a, a pretty spiffy reflow oven. And hopefully you can see this. Uh, I'll play this a couple of times, but uh, you can see when the temperature gets up to the point where the the solder paste melts, um, everything just sort of lines up. Uh, surface tension is is the most amazing and wonderful thing. Uh, you you need to be moderately careful about placing the chips. I'm going to go back and and do that uh, again because it's fun. So watch. Let's see if I can get it to play again. Here we go. So you'll see uh, when the solder melts, the chips start shifting around on the board. Uh, the surface tension pulls the chips into line. And so you, you may have done a crummy job of getting all the chips lined up on the board, but by the time you're done with the reflow, it looks perfect. They all just line up like little soldiers, uh, with some exceptions. So uh, you'll see there's some some pretty uh, there there are examples of some pretty common things here. Uh, this is called tombstoning. Uh, you see the chip instead of sticking to the other pad, it's just standing up, sort of like a tombstone. Uh, I had a few that that zipped off to the side. And so I got my soldering iron out and I, I touched them up, put them back together. Uh, it, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of fix up that needed to be done at the end. And then by golly, hooked up a power supply and come on, play, play. It's a movie, it's supposed to play. Well, you're going to have to believe me. It worked. Uh, this is a, um, uh, it's supposed to be a little movie showing the lights blink. Uh, this is just a, a, a kit. You can buy these kits uh, lots of places. I bought a, a few of them on Amazon. It's, they're intended for um, practicing hand soldering surface mount. So it's just a whole bunch of resistors and capacitors and diodes. Uh, that you're supposed to solder by hand. And by the time you finish putting this board together, the theory is, is you've gotten good at it. Uh, but it also makes a, a, a great test board. Um, and the flip side it has handy dandy uh, uh, scale to show you what all of the different component sizes are. If you can't remember how big a, an 0603 is, there you can see how big an 0603 is. So uh, I, I've I've got another uh, here. Oh, here we go. Here's my movie. Blinky lights. It worked. First board. First board I ever put through the reflow oven and it worked. So I take that as pretty good evidence that you can actually do this. Um, never expected the first one to work, work right. I'm going to show you. This is somebody else's movie. Uh, it's it, The photography is much better. So you can get a, a much better view of uh, of what happens when the solder melts and it's it's pretty cool so you can see the paste all over the place the person who put this board together took advantage of uh, another property of surface tension for these multi-pin chips for these integrated circuits you can if you want to just lay a bead of solder paste down across all of the pads and when the solder melts, the surface tension will suck the solder back onto the pads and get rid of all of the bridges. It's, it's pretty amazing. And zip, chips all line up where they're supposed to be. And you can see that one in the front there, that, that big blob of solder paste turned into eight perfectly soldered little junctions. Uh, 
Okay. That's what I had to say. I'm uh, I'm up for questions. Any questions, anybody? Nope. Hey, Mike, this is Warren. Hi, Warren. Uh, are, are there many uh, multi-layer boards produced anymore that use uh, a surface mount technology? Oh, uh, I, I would venture to say that, uh, that virtually every printed circuit board in, uh, in any commercial electronic device that is anything more than trivial, uh, you know, you, you uh, the, 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 the circuit boards in the little dealy boppers you get at the dollar store that sparkle and light up uh, that, that the kids love, those are probably single layer boards, but any real electronic device has multi-layer boards. Uh, there's no way you can cram all of this stuff in and get all the connections done on just one or two layers. I, just, I understand uh, you had an earlier uh, comment that uh, even multi-layer boards uh, were really easy with the surface mount yeah. technology. Uh, how do you explain that? Is it just the, the matter of the, the soldered paste flows down through the, the, uh, the multi-layers? Because the problem with the multi-layers has always been you screw up, uh, you know, you get one layer wrong and you're screwed. Right. You throw the board out. Right. Uh, really, the, the, the reason I think that it makes multi-layer, uh, surface mount makes multi-layer boards uh, much easier is uh, because it, so, so imagine you've got a hundred resistors on your, on your board. Uh, with through hole, you have 200 uh, wires that need to go all the way through the board. And, and they need to pierce all of the layers in the board. Um, that, that makes routing on those internal layers really complicated because you have all of these things in the way. It's, you know, like, like a, a, a basement with, with those awful support jacks that you see in a lot of houses. They're, they're always in the worst place, right? And so the, the leads on the through hole components are always in the worst possible location on one of those interior layers. With uh, surface mount, you don't have any of that stuff. So your internal layers only have the things connected to them that you really need connected to them. And you don't have all of the extraneous leads that have to penetrate the layers and be insulated so they don't contact something they're not supposed to contact. So it just, it, it, it makes routing uh, on those internal layers much, much simpler because you don't have all of these obstacles. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mike, we have a uh, question from uh, Ben Castro. He asked, uh, uh, how do you sort slash store your SMT parts uh, uh, or do you order specifically for each project? Ah. Yes, uh, good question. Um, I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing my uh, PowerPoint here and um, pull up a quick web browser. Uh, here we go. So, um, do a little screen share. Hang on while I get the right stuff in the right place. So <clears throat> this is not the way I store my components, but this is to illustrate. Uh, so surface mount components typically come in these ribbons. Uh, it's a, a strip of plastic. Uh, let's see, how do I, how do I zoom this? Um, oh, there we go. I can't zoom. Okay, you learn something every day. Um, so I apologize, I thought I could zoom into it. But basically what you've got here is chip, 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 chip. And it's kind of, it's kind of a bubble pack. Um, 
you know, you get, uh, you, you get, I don't know, your, your antihistamine, you, you, you take your Zyrtec or whatever, and it comes in a, in a, a, a card and each pill is in the, is in a little well in this plastic card. And then there's a foil cover that you peel off to get to the pill. Well, that's exactly what these strips of chips are like. They, it's a, a strip of plastic with a well for each chip and a very, very thin plastic film over the top. And uh, the machines that populate boards, the reason they ship them that way is because the commercial uh, operators don't, they don't put the, they don't have people putting the components on the boards. They use robots to, to, to place the components. And, uh, and so the, this is a cartridge from a pick and place machine and the robot, you, so there would be one of these cartridges for every kind of component that's in the particular device that's being manufactured. And the robot can very easily pierce the plastic cover and, and grab the, a chip out of there and move it over and place it on the board. So when you buy these chips, what you get is uh, if, you, if you buy from somebody like DigiKey or Mouser or uh, uh, um, one of those kinds of folks, uh, they, they buy reels of chips and they, they cut off however many you need. And so you get a, a strip of chips in a, in a uh, anti-static envelope. Uh, and you can, not surprisingly, you can buy little binders, just like you can buy binders to store all of your vacation pictures. You can buy binders to store your strips of surface mount chips. Did that answer the question? Not seeing anything more from him in the chat, though. Though Ben also gave him a uh, gave him a, a good answer there. Uh, that uh, also saying that uh, uh, small envelopes, baseball cards, leaves, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, but usually for static sensitive parts, best keep them in their static pass uh, uh, static packages. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Always a good idea. Um, if anybody's interested, if there, are, there are no other immediate. Yeah. Right. If there are no other immediate questions, I will. Uh, well, thank you very much. Okay. Well, if there's any, any closing comments, I've got one more thing I wanted to show, just because it's it's way cool. Uh, so I'm going to do another. Go back to my uh, screen share here. So this is this is the way the pros do it. This is a commercial pick and it's called a pick and place machine. Uh, it's one of these robots that that populates boards, and you can see how it works. So the it's changing tools. Now it's picking up chips. It's getting a different kind of tool for a different size chip, uh, and it's going back there to the back and picking up these large large integrated circuits and and dropping them on the board. And it's doing this, uh, it, it's a combination of prior knowledge. So the, the robot has, uh, has a, a map of the printed circuit board and knows where each component is supposed to go. Um, but also uh, it use, they use machine vision. So when they, get, when they go to pick up a, a, a chip from the, from the cassette or from that pallet in the back, uh, they actually use machine vision to make sure they're in precisely the right place to pick it up. And then when they get over to the board, again, they use a machine vision system uh, to, uh, to make sure they're setting it down in the right place. And uh, uh, I, I showed that one because it's slow. I'm gonna show the next one because it's fast and fun. So they've applied the paste before they do this, correct? Yeah, they are, they've already applied the paste uh, in, a, in a previous machine. Uh, this one I wanted to show just because it's, it's amazing. Uh, this is what's referred to as a chip shooter. It's the Gatling gun of, of pick and place machines. Always. Components mounted by these machines are around a millimeter wide 
and must be very precisely placed on the PCB. And th this is today's motherboards. This is real time. Both sides. The first side that goes into the factory process is the back side. Once the back side is done, a machine switches the main board to the other side, and the process starts again on the SMT line. Yeah, and I'll add a quick comment about those types of machines. They, uh, rather than using a single mount head that drives around and switches heads, they have a turret full of probably about somewhere between 10 and 30 heads. They're picking parts up as the other heads are placing the parts down. So that's how they're able to cycle so quickly. Right. Yeah, as I said, it's sort of like the Gatling gun of, uh, of Pick and place robots. Yeah, it's that it's really cool. I forget. Do you remember uh, how how fast the fastest are? Like, they can place like twenty or thirty thousand components an hour, right? Yeah, that sounds right. Something like that, in, on that order of magnitude. Probably they may go up to about fifty on those. Up to fifty now. Okay. Yeah. But but Mike, we'll be happy to, for for when you give your next presentation about your uh, your machine that can just do just do twenty. That we'll we'll be happy with twenty. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Mike, I recently, by accident, 